Um, I'd like to uh, welcome you all here tonight. Um, just so that there is no confusion, uh, this is the Seagray event. Um, there's a Sibsy event scheduled for 7 o'clock upstairs, so just to make sure that there's nobody going to be suddenly confused as to where they actually are. Um, my name is Dermot Dungan. I'm the Vice Chairman of the Division. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all here to Engineers Ireland for this event. Um, just before we start, a, a couple of little things. Could everybody firstly um, take note uh, of the exits and hopefully in the very unlikely event uh, that we have to um, get out of here in a hurry, uh, either through there or this one here brings us out into the yard outside. Um, the other thing is in courtesy to the, the speakers, um, could people uh, make sure that their phones, um, etc., are either turned off, and I better do it myself, <laughs> um, either turned off or put to silent. Um, uh, that's uh, nothing worse, really, than having phones ringing in the middle of it at all. Um, as I uh, state, I, I'd very much like to welcome, um, tonight we're, we're blessed with actually three um, speakers. Normally we struggle, in all honesty, to get one speaker to do an event, so we're very, very fortunate that we have three. Um, and uh, I suppose to a certain degree um, uh, I can take a little bit of credit for this event uh, taking place in the sense that um, we've had, um, Robert there has been um, reporting uh, to us uh, on Seagray and after being quite shy about it for about two and a half years I eventually asked what Seagray was um, because I don't come from this background and uh, I thought that there may well be um, a lot of merit in, in getting this explained uh, to people um, and uh, we're very fortunate that we were able to, as I say, uh, take advantage of um, uh, the kindness of the speakers who volunteered to come along. Um, uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit about the presenters um, and I, I'll be honest with you, I'm just going to read these from the, the publicity that we had got out on this. Um, Marie Hayden took the chair of the Irish National Committee of Seagray in March of 2014 and she previously held the role of Secretary and Treasurer from 2010 to 2014. She is Manager of Connection Policy and Contracts with Air Grid, where she is responsible for overseeing the issuance and management of connection contracts for generation and demand uh, customers, um, I think there's a misprint in this, um, uh, sorry, and, uh, and, and demand customers connecting to the transmission system and for uh, the uh, uh, evolution of connection policy in AirGrid. She's over 20 years experience in AirGrid and the ESB working in the areas of power system operation, planning and market design, including five years as shift controller in the National Control Center from 2001 to 2006. Uh, Mary, Mar is it Mary or Marie? Marie. Marie, um, uh, Marie obtained her BE uh, from UCD in 1993 and her Masters in Engineering Management from UCD in 2011. Uh, we also have Neve Delaney and Neve is a Chartered Engineer and works in the Market Development Department of Airgrid where she is Principal Market an analysis, uh, an Analyst having worked on the design of the single ec electricity market and subsequently on the design of the trading mechanism for the east-west interconnector. Neve previously worked in the ancillary services of Airgrid. Prior to, prior to joining Airgrid, she worked in optical control system design for Philips in the Netherlands and Singapore, and in science journalism. She holds a BE in electronic engineering from Dublin City University and a master uh, MSc in science communication from Queen's University, Belfast, and Dublin City University. Uh, Nuala Kennedy is a consultant engineer and has worked for nine years with ESB Ireland where she currently manages a team that delivers uh, distribution and transmission HV station projects nationwide. Nuala obtained her Bachelor of Engineering degree from Dublin City University, her postgraduate diploma in uh, project management from Trinity College in Dublin and a certificate in health and safety at work from UCD. Um, Tonight, um, they're going to give us uh, three, three talks uh, that they prepared for the Seagra conference. Am I correct in that? Yeah. Um, and what we're going to do is we will call on them, um, each one after the other. Um, and at the end of it, we'll have an open question and answer session. So rather than after each presenter, we'll wait until the end of the three presentations. And then uh, you can have any um, 
uh, questions, um, that you like. Um, so, uh, can I, I call on um, uh, Marie first to come up and do hers? Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Dermot. So, um, Seagray is actually quite a well-kept secret in the electricity industry. There's no shame whatsoever in not having heard of it or not knowing about it, but it does mean I'm delighted to have the opportunity this evening to just address the audience and tell you a bit about the organisation of Seagray. Um, I'm going to talk about the organisation and Neve and Nuala will be presenting papers which they both were accepted for proceedings at the big conference in Paris last year and which were presented at that conference. So what is Seagre? Well, it's a French uh, uh, organization originally. It was founded in Paris in 1921. Um, I'll just click, go back to the previous slide because I'm not very good at French, so you'll have to, I have to read this. Uh, it stands for the Conseil International de Grande Réseau Électrique, or the International Council on Large Electric Systems. And really what it is, it's a knowledge sharing organization. It's there to facilitate the sharing of knowledge between experts who are working in the power <coughs> industry and in all aspects of the power industry across the globe. Um, it's, as I say, it's sort of, um, it's very much a, a knowledge sharing. It's there to generate new ideas, to create innovation, but it's very much there to do it for a societal benefit. It's there to improve the electric power systems across the world, very much with a societal benefit focus. It has a worldwide audience. Seagray is now present in 90 different countries. Um, countries with more than 20 or 30 members have their own national committees. So there's 58 national committees. Ireland has a national committee. There's 14,000 members in Seagray. So it really has quite a wide reach. I suppose the key thing about Seagray, which makes it uh, relatively unique, is it's very much focused on the experiential learning, the practical experience people have who are working in the industry more so than a purely academic uh, focus. So it takes maybe some academic concepts, but then looks at how they get implemented in real life in power systems, and how the people from the power industry across the world are tackling the problems that they're facing and sharing that information amongst themselves. As I say, it is a not-for-profit organization. It doesn't have any commercial bias. Uh, it doesn't set standards, so it's very much there for societal benefit. So how does Seagray work? That's just sort of an organic ram of it. Um, the president, treasurer, and technical committee chair are the three primary roles which direct Seagray. They're all non-paid voluntary basis elected by the administration council. There's a small office of employees of Seagray based in Paris, and the secretary general would be one of the full-time employees of Seagray. But pretty much everything else undertaken by Seagray is done, uh, people giving up their own time uh, to, do, to contribute. From a technical perspective, the work of Seagray is coordinated by a technical committee, which is divided into 16 study committees, and each study committee then sets up working groups to um, specialize and investigate specific topics of interest at the time. The national committees represent the members in their country. They organize events for the members in their country, and they also um, coordinate the um, nomination of uh, Irish of, of, of members onto working groups and onto study committees. And then the administration council and the steering committee, um, they would both set the direction of Seagray and just make sure it's uh, healthy functioning as an organization. So on this slide here, you can see the 16 study committees of Seagray. Um, as you can see at its core, it's a very technical institution. It covers all aspects of the electricity uh, system from the production, transmission, and distribution of electricity. It also looks at issues like electricity market, the regulation of the electricity market, and the telecommunications um, systems. So the study committees follow the four strategic directions which have been set by the um, Administration Council of Seagray. So you can see there the four, currently the four strategic directions are the electrical power system of the future, making the best use of existing assets, focusing on environment and sustainability and interactive communication with the public and with the political decision makers. So I think anybody who's involved in the electricity industry in Ireland will very much be able to relate to these four areas as being areas which are very hot topics in their own right um, within Ireland, within the development of the power system in Ireland. We're facing issues right across all of these four areas and it's kind of reassuring to see at a global le level we have that in common sort of with our colleagues um, in, who are working in power systems across the world. Everybody is seeing the same set of challenges 
So that's both reassuring, but it's also very helpful because it means we can come together as a community to solve them. Um, so the study committees, they set up what's called working groups, and the um, working groups are given very, very specific um, areas to investigate. So, for example, um, the working group under uh, B2, B2 is overhead lines, and they very recently set up a working group to look at forecasting dynamic line rating. So that's looking at ways to estimate how much additional capacity you can get out of a power line as a result of uh, wind, as a result of cooler temperatures, ambient temperatures, as a result of a lack of uh, sunlight. And this really helps to maximize the use of existing assets. And that's the kind of working group that's been set up under B2. Um, C6, C6 is to do with distribution systems. C6 very recently set up a working group on hybrid systems for off-grid power supply. So this is very much <coughs> looking at global electrification, bringing electricity to all humans across the globe. And how do you do that in a strategic way, utilizing small um, little island power systems created from solar power, from wind turbines, from diesel. Uh, generators and then doing it in a way that you can strategically link them as the electrification grows and expands. And that's the kind of work that Seagray does. Um, at any one point in time, there's probably about 180 working groups going uh, active across the world. They probably take, they typically should take around between one and three years to report back, depending on the scope of the working group. Um, and typically they will have about 20 members, of which you'll probably find 10 are very, very active, and 10 just get their names onto the uh, report <laughs> at the end of it. But I think that's quite common. Anybody who works in these type of organizations will have come across that. So um, basically we have around 3,500 people working on working groups today and um, trying to develop ideas and, and share experiences. The output of the working group is usually a technical brochure, which is, tends to be quite a big document of, of usually over 100 pages. Um, with an awful lot of uh, data collected and some recommendations and, and experiences documented. Uh, the, the technical brochures <coughs> are sometimes synthesized into smaller articles in the Electra magazine. I just left some of the Electra magazine up there, um, which is the um, bi-monthly magazine issued by Seagray to all of its members. Um, and then um, basically when it comes to sharing the information and the knowledge through the community, we have both the conferences like the conference and even NULA were at last year where they presented their papers which was the big session, as they call it, in Paris. So every second year, there's a rather large conference run in Paris. About 4,000 people turn up. It goes on for the full week. All of the study committees are represented at the Paris session. Um, then that happens in the even years. So that was 2014, this year we had that. Um, in the odd years, then, there's one or two symposiums. And the symposiums tend to be not all, working, not all study committees. You might have five or six study committees coming together to form a symposium. Um, and as I say, there's typically about two per year, and they're in the odd years. And then, of course, at a national committee level, you can have regional meetings set up, or one or two study committees may come together and set up meetings in, in uh, various locations on very targeted subject matter. All of the information is disseminated through the proceedings of conferences, through the publication of brochures, the publication of the Electra magazine, and all of the documents are available to the members of Seagray online. So there's a really vast library of uh, documentation on every possible. So the Irish National Committee, um, the Irish National Committee just very recently launched its website after quite a prolonged period of development, and it's uh, just there, secretireland.ie. So if you get a chance to go on to it, please do feedback to us, um, your views on it. Um, the Irish National Committee, the first member of Seagray from Ireland, as I say, Seagray was founded in 1921, nearly 100 years ago. The first member from Ireland was Dr. Bob Cuff, who came from the system planning function in ESB and joined Seagray in 1952. Um, he was obviously joined by a few colleagues because they must have had enough numbers to form a national committee. And the first national committee meeting took place on the 31st of January, 1955, which when I was looking at this made me realize the next January we have the 60th anniversary of that event, so we'll have to celebrate it. Um, but we had the 130th meeting of the national committee last November. So there really is a very long tradition of Irish involvement in Seagray and something that has grown substantially every year. I'm very pleased to say that the number of members of Seagray through Ireland has continued to grow across those decades and the participation of members from Ireland has also continued to grow. And I suppose in these days and these times, people have less time to dedicate to this kind of, shall we say, altruistic work. And it's really great for us to see so many Irish members continuing to get involved, being supported by the employers and taking their own personal time to be involved in Seagray to 
contribute to the work that we're doing here in Ireland into the Seagrey community and also to take benefit from the experience of the Seagrey community to inform us of the work that we're trying to do ourselves here. We also have had quite a lot of uh, distinguished members from Ireland. Ireland really bats above its um, weight in Seagrey. We've had 14 <coughs> distinguished members and 10 technical committee awards and in 2014 uh, this year, Michael Power, formerly of ESB and Airgrid, who now works in UCD, was made a Fellow of Seagrey. This is a new award in Seagrey, and there's only four of them were handed out this year. So we were incredibly proud of Michael's achievements, that his long um, and distinguished career and his contribution to Seagrey over many decades was recognised at the highest level. It really was a, a great moment for Michael, and, and we're very, very proud of his achievement. But Michael is one of many, many people who've been involved in Seagrey and really contributed to it over the decades. And uh, Michael himself would, I'm sure, be the first to admit that there were many people, if this award had existed before, many Irish members would equally have been deserving of this award. The Irish National Committee, our primary role really is just to provide a, a, a mechanism by which people and Irish people working in the uh, electricity industry can access the Seagrey community, can both participate in it by being involved in working groups and study committees, but also um, can access the vast amount of literature uh, that is available from Seagrey. And that's really our primary purpose. We do um, <coughs> events for our members. So last year, in fact, in this room, we held a, an event uh, titled Small Electric Solutions to Big Electrical Problems, and we were delighted that over 80 people attended that event. And in 2017, we're incredibly honoured to host the first ever Seagray Symposium in Ireland. So two guests chosen to hold a symposium is a very competitive thing, and I think after over 60 years of participation in Seagray, it's probably about time we managed to, to secure one. Um, I know 2017 probably seems a long time away, but when you're on the organising committee, it seems like it's just around the corner. Uh, the event will run over a week. We'll have 500 overseas participants, and many of them will bring partners with them as well. So it's a good inward investment for Ireland um, in a, from a tourist perspective, a great opportunity for Ireland to showcase everything it is doing in the power system and in that sector, and a really fantastic learning opportunity for anybody who's in the industry. Um, there are tutorial sessions. There are symposium proceedings and papers. There's a technical exhibition, a technical visit, and we're really looking forward to hosting that in 2017. I suppose when you look back over the years of participation and you kind of say, well, where have we really benefited from being members? And this is really such a small subset of the benefits we've received here in Ireland. I talk often about societal benefit, and we've done a lot of big things on the power system uh, in Ireland over the years. And going back a couple of decades, there was a big conversion of the 110 kV transmission system away from being arc suppressed to neutral earth. And the people involved in that here in Ireland benefited enormously from the experience that other, other power system operators had of doing that. And similarly, we've had to develop quite a lot of innovative ways of dealing with the sudden loss of generators on a small island power system. And we've contributed that information back to Seagray and our developments and things that we've done, like fast wind down and, uh, and, and automatic uh, load shedding, automatic frequency restoration. Uh, we've given an awful lot back to the Seagrey community and sharing our experiences on these very innovative developments at the time. Fast forwarding to today, the <coughs> modern power system or the future power system, I suppose the future is here in many ways, and we are dealing with an awful lot of challenges trying to operate an electricity system with very high levels of wind, with very low levels of system, uh, internet, um, sorry, system inertia. Um, we're seeing the distribution network become a very active network. There's a lot of generation on it. That presents challenges for the distribution system. It presents challenges for voltage control. And of course, we are also seeing very much in the public eye um, a very significant objection to the deployment of overhead line infrastructure. And so one of the big issues for us is, well, how do we avoid even the need for overhead line infrastructure? Can we be more creative and innovative in the way we develop the power system? And where we can't avoid the need, how can we minimize the impact of these types of structures um, so that the society can accept this infrastructure and so that we can de develop a, a secure grid and a, and, and a cost-effective one of that. And so um, just to jump to one page here, this is just a list of some of the public um, publications I just pulled down off the Seagray website recently on things like overhead lines, and these have been brought together by the community of Seagray. You'll see towards the bottom, for example, there's a paper on camouflaging power lines to reduce their visual, visual impacts. You can see there, and under the technical brochures, information about the application of real-time monitoring system, and this is about really almost avoiding the need for infrastructure if at all possible. 
or how do you take existing overhead lines, the fourth one there, the technical brochure, how have other countries taken existing overhead lines and either uprated them so that they can carry more power, or in fact even increased the voltage at which they operate, again, so they can carry more power. And that means that instead of building additional infrastructure, you're reutilizing existing infrastructure, you're not creating new rights of way, you're not going into new areas. And so it's really great to have access to the information and the experience of, um, as I say, the global community and how they've uh, dealt with these challenges themselves. Similarly, again, more about what we're giving back in terms of system inertia. Um, many of you will know Ireland is leading the way in operating these, this very um, power system with very high levels of wind, and we're doing incredibly innovative, incredibly smart work on this right across every sector in the electricity industry in Ireland. We're looking at how we can change existing conventional power stations, how can we deploy smarter wind farms, how can we get synthetic inertia, how can we operate power systems better. And we really are leading the world in this, and through the Seagrave community, we're contributing an awful lot back to the world and saying, this is how we're doing it, this is how you overcome these problems. And that's very important to us. It's not just about showcasing how great <coughs> Ireland is and how good we are, but we really believe very strongly in, in the sustainable power systems. We feel very strongly that the power system of the future has to be decarbonized. And so be, a, being able to share that experience and those learnings with an international community can help other people overcome those challenges and can really help decarbonize the power systems of the world. And so this is very important to us uh, in, in so many different ways. So the benefits of participation, I hope I've been able to just communicate to you there a bit about how that exchange of information can work in, in a sort of a two-way basis. Um, anybody who is a member of CGRE can participate in working groups and study committees, and obviously anybody, you don't have to be a member of CGRE to attend uh, their conferences or their symposiums, but members do obviously get preferential rates, so if, if it's something you're going to do, it could certainly be benefit to be a member. Um, I think probably the greatest benefit is the access to all of that information on the online on the ecgray.org uh, website. And with a membership number, you can access such a vast array of information on so many different subjects. There literally is something there for everybody. So it's a great opportunity to learn, a great opportunity to share, and a great opportunity to drive innovation. Um, I think with that, I'm going to pass you on now to uh, Neve Delaney, who presented a paper on facilitating demand-side response in <coughs> the single electricity market in Ireland. I was there when she presented the paper, and it was many, one of many papers presented, but I can tell you it generated a huge amount of interest from the audience, an enormous amount of questions and answers, and we've actually been asked to uh, present again at another on exactly the same topic at another uh, symposium in, in Sweden and to really share with the world how we're integrating demand-side management into the power system today. So uh, with, without further delay, I will invite uh, Neve up to the stage to share her learnings. Thanks, Marie. Um, God, I hope I can live up to that introduction. <laughs> um, so Marie, when she was presenting there, showed uh, a slide with a number of different study committees for CGRE. And one of them was Study Committee 5, which is the Committee for um, Electricity Markets and Regulation. And uh, within Study Committee 5, there's a subsection on demand response, which is what um, my paper is about. Um, so demand response, I suppose, what is it and, and why are we interested in it? Um, demand response is really about getting electricity users to change the way in which they use their energy demand, maybe by altering um, the time at which they use it, by using less during the peak or, and, or switching it to off-peak times. And it's useful for, from a system operator perspective because it provides additional flexible capacity which reduces the need for investment and generation. Um, in a, a system such as ours, it's also useful in managing a um, high level of wind penetration. And from the point of view of a wholesale electricity market, it reduces the level of price and elastic demand. Um, so I'm briefly just going to go through a few of the schemes that were in place before we integrated demand response into the single electricity market. Um, the winter peak demand reduction scheme was set up by Airgrid in 2003 and at the time, generation capacity was very tight during the winter months. So the scheme basically um, encouraged and paid demand, um, paid uh, large industrial customers to reduce their demand between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. on business days during winter months. And it was very effective. We consistently achieved a level of over 100 megawatts 
um, every day um, between those two hours. Uh, Short-term active response then, STAR. This is an interruptible load type scheme, which is, is still running. It's been running for over 20 years. And basically, customers are contracted um, to make some of their load or, or all of their load um, available for interruption. Uh, the sites are fitted with under-frequency relays. And if um, uh, there's a generator trip on the system and the frequency drops down to a certain level, then the load will be disconnected. So there's currently 45 um, megawatts um, of load contracted under STAR, and that provides reserves then to the system operator. And um, because our, our island, our um, single electricity market is an all island market, um, I also would mention some of the demand response in the north. And um, there um, they have uh, economy seven, which is a, a storage and water heating tariff um, and it's similar, I suppose, to Night Saver down here in that houses are fitted with a meter that has a, a different tariff for, for night and day and they're, they're provided with a, a cheaper rate at night to charge up their storage heaters and also heat their water. And although it's a tariff, it's considered demand response because th the meters are remotely controlled um, via radio broadcast um, signals and tele switches. So those were... Um, some, just some of the demand side response initiatives that were in place before the single electricity market launched in 2007. Um, some of you might be quite familiar with the SEM, but uh, just at a really high level for those that aren't, um, the SEM is, uh, is a gross mandatory pool type market, which basically means that um, all generation above a certain de minimis level of 10 megawatts has to bid into the pool, has to offer into the pool, and suppliers buy from that pool. So there's a single half hourly price set for every half hour in the trading day that runs from six o'clock in the morning till six o'clock in the evening. And when the SEM was set up, um, there were a number of principles, and, but one of them was that the regulators wanted to increase the amount of demand response. And so there was a, separate, a set of rules set for a particular type of unit called a demand side unit. And demand side units in the SEM are treated like a, a type of generator in that they offer in their demand reduction to the SEM. They could either be a large site offering in its demand reduction or an aggregation of smaller sites offering in their demand reduction. And in the Irish market, it's, it's mainly an aggregation of smaller sites offering in. Just like generators, then they get paid from the market and they make their money really by capacity payments where they get money for being available. Um, so I, I suppose, as I mentioned, that one um, of the principles of SAM was enabling demand-side response. But when SAM started up, there was very poor uptake. There was only one demand-side unit registered at market start. Um, and we soon became aware that there were a number of barriers um, to market entry. There were two in particular. The first was about around demand side aggregation. Uh, there was a rule in the market that said that if you were aggregating a number of demand sites together, they all had to be supplied by the same supplier of electricity. And that created a difficulty for um, potential aggregator businesses that wanted to sign up customers because they'd all have to have the same supplier of electricity. Um, the second issue um, was that demand sites that had on-site generation. You could have a small amount of on-site generation, but you weren't allowed to have an export capability onto the grid. And in the scheme, the winter peak demand reduction scheme, we'd had some very reliable customers that uh, had combined heat and power plants uh, on their sites, things like dairies that have a CHP that size to, give a, uh, to meet a given heat load and has an exporting capability. And they also wanted to participate in the market but initially weren't allowed. So um, after a lot of uh, discussion, uh, there were two rule changes implemented in 2012 to facilitate more demand side participation. Uh, so this graph gives a, a snapshot in, in January when um, this paper was submitted of the um, demand side response growth, I suppose, since the start of the market. So the colored <coughs> box there, bless you, Colour blocks there are all demand side units. Um, you can see there at the start of the market, uh, there was one demand side unit of 20 megawatts that registered, and it actually deregistered then in 2009. 
um, when there were additional rules uh, brought into the market to, for a type of unit called an aggregated generator unit and it became one of those. So that for over two years there was really no demand response in the market and the uh, red and black triangles and vertical lines there show the point at which the rules changed and you can see there was there was quite um, quite a steep increase then in the level of demand response in the market. So by January of this year, we had 83 megawatts um, of demand response uh, with a further 50 megawatts in the process of registration. Um, fast forwarding on then to last week, um, this is the picture. Uh, the response has been steadily growing. We now have eight demand side sorry, seven demand side units in the market and uh, with a, totally 150 megawatts and there's another 13 megawatts in the process of registration and more interest. So um, the rule changes have had a, you know, a really significant impact on the level of demand side response in the market and we're actively engaging indus with industry to enable further growth Um, at the moment, we're engaging in an exercise to redesign the market into uh, an integrated SEM market, the ISEM, which will comply with the European target model. And certainly, the experience that we've had within SEM should be brought into that in, in terms of making sure that the rules that are chosen for demand side units in ISEM are such that they can fit you know, the business models of potential demand side units. Uh, while of cor course ensuring that the, the type of demand response that's achieved is very useful from a system operational point of view. Um, another aspect of the paper um, discusses facilitating uh, communication with demand side units. Um, although demand side units are treated like a type of generator in the market, um, they're, they're generally quite small, um, small scale cost sensitive type businesses and at the moment for communicating with the generator, uh, between the generator and the national control center, uh, the only means is via remote terminal unit, or the only means up until now has, has been that. And road terminal units are quite large. They're about one meter cubed and they're relatively expensive. So the RCU and cabling and communications will cost about 31,000 euro. Um, it's probably also not the most technically appropriate means for a demand side unit to communicate because as you can see there there's a fair amount of digital to analog conversion required because uh, there has to be an analog signal input into the RTU and then it has to be sampled back uh, before it's, it's sent to the national control center. So since September of this year um, one of the TSUs in the market has been trialing using secure intercontrol center protocol or SICCP um, so this is basically uh, replacing the RTU with communicating across a secure connection across the internet. Um, this has a number of advantages in that it's, it's, it's much cheaper. It's about 50% uh, of the cost of an RTU. It's also much smaller. Um, and the ongoing operating and maintenance costs should also be a lot, lot less because you don't have to maintain the RTU and the associated equipment. So this is an overview of, of the configuration. The um, area there bounded by the orange box on top um, shows the system operator equipment and uh, there below around, with the blue box around it is the demand side unit equipment. And just there at the end of the orange box, there's two um, virtual private network routers. So this is the equipment that's pre-configured and sent out to the DSU and all communication um, goes through these. Um, obviously, across the internet, there's a certain risk of cyber attack, but um, as you can see, it's quite heavily firewalled and there is a demilitarized zone there as well. And the inherent security of the SICCP software militates <coughs> against that risk. Um, the, uh, I suppose in addition to um, paying for the two routers, the, uh, the DSU also has to pay for, has to procure the ICCP software. Um, in the pilot, there was, uh, the, 
various quotes for that, but it's about 10,000 euro. So the router has cost 6,000 euro and the software is about 10,000 euro. So it's 16,000 euro as opposed to the 31,000 for the RTU. And much, much smaller, about 99% smaller than the RTU. So I suppose just in summary then, um, the main elements of the paper were, was that um, you know, the choice of market of rules has a really significant impact on demand side participation and our experience of that is something that we, we want to bring forward to the next market and also that you know, it's, it's possible to improve real-time communications with demand side using new technology like SICPCP. Um, so I think we're waiting to, for questions until the end, but thanks for listening. Good evening, everybody. My name is Neela Kennedy. I'm from ESB International. And this evening I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the paper that myself and my colleague Sean wrote for the Great 2014 Paris session. <coughs> the title of the paper is Low Cost and Fast Deployment Distribution Substations. But before we get into that, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the distribution system in Ireland. Now, as you probably already know, the transmission system is operated by our colleagues here in Airgrid as the TSO, the Transmission System Operator. The distribution system is owned and operated by ESB Networks. As you can see, it's very vast and very extensive, covering the entire island. It consists of overhead lines, underground cables, and substations. Now, back between 2001 and 2006, rather, there was about 4 billion euro invested <coughs> in the distribution system. During that time, about 75,000 kilometers of lines were refurbished and about 800,000 wood poles were replaced. Following on from that, between 2006 and 2010, a further 2.5 billion was spent, and a large portion of that was spent on substation refurbishment projects. And we'll come back to those projects in a minute. Now, in Ireland, a distribution substation operates at 38 kV, stepping down to MV, which is at either 10 or 20 kV. There's approximately 500 of them in the country, um, each one would feed a mid-sized town with up to maybe 5,000 customers on it. There are three types of stations. There is an outdoor, where the 38 and the MV is outdoor AIS, air insulated switchgear. <coughs> Hybrid stations, where the 38 kV is outdoor AIS and the MV is indoor GIS, gas insulated switchgear. And indoor stations, where both the 38 and the MV is indoor AIS. That's a picture there of what we call a Siemens station. Siemens came to Ireland in the 1920s and built these as part of the national infrastructure for ESB. They're very German. They all look the exact same. And despite being almost 100 years old, some of them, they're still structurally in perfect condition. But they're very compact and they were built on a very small piece of land. They have limited capacity, and once that's reached, no further lines can be taken out of the station. And often the switchgear inside was very old, and in some cases obsolete, which made maintenance and spare parts extremely challenging. So back to those substation refurbishment projects. ESB International were the design consultants to ESB Networks for those projects, and that's how myself and Sean got involved. It started with a pilot of 11 stations. And following on from that, in 2007, a further 30 stations were identified for refurbishment. Now, if you do something repetitively, after the first few times, you should start to do it faster, smarter, and more cost-effectively. You should look at what you've done and see where you can gain efficiencies. Where can you save time and money? And that's what our paper was about, examining those efficiencies, low cost and fast deployment. The biggest efficiency was around the use of modular substations. Now previously, during that pilot of 11 stations, we were replacing outdoor AIS stations with indoor GIS stations. So a large conventional blockwork building was built 
and into it was put the 38 and MV GIS and the associated control and protection and battery systems. In modules, the 38 KV is fitted into one module. That's the 38 KV module there. That's the MV module with the MV GIS inside, and that's the control and protection module at the end. That's a fully modular station. It's actually an ACE 38 KV station. And the use of modules meant that civil works was halved. It was cut from 24 to 12 weeks. And on top of that, the electrical fit out of those modules could take place off site at the same time as the civil works were ongoing. And the biggest advantage of them was that you could <coughs> drop them in and around those Siemens stations without having to actually extend the site. And don't forget, back in 2007, property prices were at an all time high. That's a picture of Greg 38 KV station in Carlow. You can see it's on the main road there, and it's surrounded on the other three sides by local businesses. And that's it with its modules installed. And what you can't see is behind these two modules on the right-hand side are two new 10 MVA power transformers. And we wrote a little bit in our paper about how we, how we got these in position. And in the case of Greg, we had a road closing license one very early one Sunday morning in the summer. It was about 5 o'clock. And we lifted in the three modules and the two transformers in the space of a few hours. And in some cases, there were MV lines crossing the station, and we couldn't get an outage on those lines. And in those cases, we used the jack and skid method to install the modules, whereby we slid the modules into position. Other efficiencies were gained through standardizing switchgear control and protection. We wanted our new stations to be a little bit like those old Siemens stations in that they would all look the same, and not from an aesthetics point of view. Using standard design templates reduces design time and thereby speeds up the project. Our switchgear orders were no longer bespoke. We set up term contracts with the switchgear manufacturers and we limited ourselves to one or two choices. So for example, the MV switch here is either 11 or 16 cubicles, depending on the size of the local area that it's going to be feeding. It also meant that orders could be redeployed as necessary. So if, for example, Greg suddenly shot up the list in terms of priority, switch gear that was ordered for Ballon Robe could be reassigned to Greg uh, and thereby accelerating project delivery. And that's the picture of um, MVGIS in its module. Now, we had used GIS indoors before, but th the switch gear that we'd used before um, needed rear access for HV cable termination. Uh, that wasn't going to be suitable for a module because we needed to be able to put it up against the wall. Like they are relatively small. So we chose switch gear with uh, floor entry cables for, for termination. Another area that we looked at was standardizing protection. In a lot of cases, we were replacing old relays like that one there, old mechanical re electromechanical relays. And again, a testament to engineering standards of the time. Some of those were 40 years old, and they were still working perfectly. But of course, they wouldn't have been compatible with our new switchgear. So we chose specific relays for specific functions. The 38 kV line cubicles are protected by impedance relays, protecting the cubicle from faults on the line. The transformers are protected by overcurrent and differential relays, again, uh, protecting the transformers from current surges and internal faults. And we chose a multifunction relay for the MV side which could protect either transformers or line bays. That's a picture of one there protecting a 20 kV line in Bunkrana in County Donegal. We looked at standardizing control. So traditionally, all the control and alarm signals from the switchgear and the relays was hardwired back to the control room. Um, we reviewed this and decided to implement a digital system and the effect of this was that the number of cables used was reduced dramatically, which of course increased, uh, rather reduced, <laughs> installation time. And a single digital system had much greater flexibility with it, and it also replaced quite a number of large standalone hard pieces of hardware. For example, the AAP, the alarm annunciation panel, the mimic panel, which looks like that, and you probably can't tell, but that's two meters high and 1.2 meters wide. And that was replaced by two widescreen monitors. 
So again, all the time saving space. Um, the battery system, those thir old 38 kV stations, they would have had a single outdoor 24 volt DC battery. When we started with the pilot, when we were doing uh, indoor GIS stations, we set up a battery, something like that. We were using lead acid wet cell batteries. Um, they vent off gases during their charging cycle, so they need to be kept in their own room. And there's also always a, a small risk of acid spillage. But obviously that wasn't going to be suitable for a module. So we chose a VRLA valve, regu valve regulated lead acid battery, which is sealed. It doesn't require any maintenance and it doesn't need a separate room. And you can see them there at the forefront of the picture and that's the inside of a control room module. So just to finish off, the life cycle and maintenance of the stations that we were uh, refurbishing, we chose well, what the suppliers deem to be maintenance-free switchgear. Um, typical AIS routine maintenance was extended or in some cases excluded. And of course, because it's indoor equipment, it's not subject to the effects of weather or pollution. And all the time we built in spare capacity for future development as well. And that's just briefly what our paper was about. And just to finish off by saying a few words about the Seagray experience. Uh, the initial input is very little. It's only 500 words for your synopsis, and you can join up and do it with someone else, like when myself and Sean did it. Um, if you're successful, you have three months then to write your paper. It's reviewed and supported by two committee members from Seagray, and they, they give lots of help and support along the way. And of course, you get to go to Paris. Um, we did a poster session there. There's, there's so many people there, and they were so interested in what we did, and they were so interested to hear what they were doing as well. So, you know, I just say, if you have an idea, jot it down, give it a go, and we might see you in Paris in 2016. Thank you. <laughs>